Bingo, we're back, two o'clock rock. Likeable science, pushing the envelope in science with our chief scientist, Ethan Allen, uh, Think Tech's chief scientist, a, a great guy and the ordinary host, um, but we work together on these shows and we're calling this one The Zoo and You. Why are we calling it The Zoo and You? Well, because uh, we're a team, we're all a team and um, we're you're trying to get along in this universe. <laughs> <laughs> by collaboration, you know, it's the original collaboration between us and the biome. That means all the, you know, all the um, bacteria and whatnot that we have living with us as symbiotic uh, collaborators in this life. Right. And uh, there was a show on, was it yesterday, Terry Gross on uh, NPR, where she interviewed a guy named Ed Young, uh, who wrote a book called I Contain Multitudes. And the multitudes are the reference to uh, all these uh, bacteria. And um, he also has a blog called Not Exactly Rocket Science. He talked about that. But it was really interesting, and I do want to pursue it, and you're the perfect guy to pursue it with, Ethan, um, is exactly what's going on at the, at the edge of science here. Um, we, we know the problem. We did not know it before, but in recent years, um, we have learned that we are a team with all these um, bacteria. And, uh, and our health is dependent on having a good relationship with all these bacteria. Um, and I guess the question I put to you is, um, you know, just exactly how dependent are we? Could we live without them? And if we're going to live well, I guess we need to live with them, but how do we live with them well? Ethan Allen, our <laughs> chief scientist. Take it away, Ethan. <laughs> well, yes, uh, they, are, they are part and parcel with us from the day we're born and, and they change over our lifespans. We, we have types of colonies of bacteria that, that uh, populations alter and shift. There's a typical infant colonization and it gradually changes as we move into adulthood. Fairly stable. You can change your gut bacteria by changing your diet radically. That's usually fairly plastic that comes back. We don't actually apparently desperately need all of our bacteria. We could live without them. Uh, it would be a very different life. There's lots of animals that couldn't live without them. All the ungulates who go around eating grass, they can't digest the grass. It's their bacteria that digest the grass. Termites can't digest wood. It's their bacteria that digest wood. So there's lots and lots and lots of animals that would promptly drop dead. We probably wouldn't, but the world would be so changed without our bacteria that we'd we wouldn't recognize it, basically. Yeah. But um, how do we get them originally? I mean, when we come out of our mother's womb, you, um, we you are basically infected. Indeed, in, it's an interesting point you bring up because when you a typical vaginal delivery actually inoculates uh, an infant with bacteria, the, the womb itself is actually sterile, basically, and has no bacteria in it. So, you, and you get your first dose basically coming out that way. And so, if you are born via C-section, you actually have a rather different set of bacteria. Interesting. Yeah, and no, this has actually been shown. They've actually done swabs from kids, and, and they find out the kids' bacterial colonies are quite different from those two modes of delivery. Which way is better? Because you, we know that if you have, you know, a good collection of bacteria, you're going you're gonna to live really well. If you right. don't, you're right. not. They gradually meld back to where you can't tell in an adult necessarily which way they, which, whether they were born by C-section or not. Uh, so there is some plasticity in it. But probably it's not unreasonable to, to suspect that in these first hours, days, weeks, months, perhaps even years of life, having a good start with the right bacteria that you, that you picked up from your mom is probably a real advantage to that. You know? Now there's two kinds. One is on your skin. Right, many, 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 many. many well, I should say one, right. yeah, one. But there are, and the other is in, in your passages. Right. That doesn't mean in your flesh. That means in your passages, where you breathe, where your blood flows, your intestine, all that. Yeah. Those passages. You know, it reminds me of the of the whole notion that we came from the sea, mm -hmm. and way back when, all of our surfaces, if you will, including the surfaces of these passageways were exposed to the sea and we had all these symbiotic relationships. Mm -hmm. Now we have evolved into closed passage, I mean mm -hmm. inside passageways, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean we don't have these symbiotic relations. And, but the symbiotic bacteria live on the skin, which is exposed, and in the passageways, which used to be exposed. 
Yeah, they live everywhere. I mean, realistically, we, you say on the skin. Real, realistically, they live under the surface layers of the skin. Ah. There are some on the very surface, but there's lots more. There's a, about a million per square inch. A million per, per square, square inch, inch under at the lower levels of the skin. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they're everywhere. They're bacteria. They outnumber your own cells 10 to 1, you know. Uh, uh, you have probably 20, 25,000 genes, but the bacteria in you probably have you know, 500 times that many genes. So, you know, so we, assuming the symbiosis, yeah, oh, then, then we, ha we are dependent on all of those genes. They're, they do good things for us, certainly. You know, we can digest very simple sugars, short little tiny sugars, the little monosaccharides and a little bit bigger disaccharides. But the big complex sugars, we can't digest. Very fortunately for us, our bacteria can digest those. Just they, like the grass. And they, yeah, and they break them down for us and allow us to eventually digest the simpler ones. Yeah. yeah. So it's, uh, I mean, they do a lot of good for us. Yeah. If, if your bacteria get out of whack, uh, they can start causing trouble. Your uh, intestines get a little bit leaky. You start having fluids that shouldn't be sort of inside you. That is away from you your intestines. You start having diarrhea? No, 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 they get into your body and cause inflammation. Oh. It's, it's thought they maybe underlie that kind of problem, a bacterial problem, a mi microbiome problem may underlie autoimmune diseases, diabetes, all these kinds of conditions. Um, so, Well, yeah, you know, and, and, that, and we don't know yet, do right, we? Right, right. We're, we're, we're scratching you the say surface may, of this. Yeah. But in fact, it could be, and uh, we, we, hopefully in a few years we will know, um, whether you know a, a bad biome will will give you all these other problems, including uh, immune problems, which lead to everything else. Right. Um, so how 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 do we find out what our biome is? You know, I can take my DNA, I can swab my mouth and send it in, and they'll give me a complete report. And they know a lot. Mm -hmm. They know you know they know a hundred thousand years of my background in one swab. Right. But. You know, with, with the biome, we don't have that technology, or do we? Well, the, the problem is, again, one, human, the human genome has been pretty well studied, so they know what human genes are, and they, they can identify those pretty quickly and easily and tell you yeah, what yours are. But it's not just you've got one bacteria or ten kinds of bacteria or a thousand kinds of bacteria. There are probably a hundred thousand kinds of bacteria in you many of which have not been identified yet. And mine are different from yours. Yep, yep. We have different different sets. We may have some strains in common, but we have different amounts of those strains. We have different than out, different outliers. So yeah, there's so much more information. They can't they can't go and sequence a hundred thousand different organisms. Well uh, are my organisms going to be related to my DNA? What I mean is if if my hundred thousand years of experience I and mean, it's probably more than mm -hmm. that on the planet, uh, makes me this way, the way mm -hmm. I am does that mean um, that I'm carrying bacteria that is different from the bacteria you have because you have a different 100,000 years behind you? Now, that's an interesting question. I, I don't know how much our evolution shapes are the biomes that we carry versus our personal experience. Well, put it this way, then. I'll change my question. <clears throat> if I take your bacteria, am I going to be more like you? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is interesting, actually, if they find people who have uh, inflammatory bowel disease, that kind of stuff, Crohn's disease, and they essentially take, and it sounds sort of weird, but, but if they do what's called fecal transplants, and they basically take some uh, poop from somebody who's healthy and implant that into the intestines of the person with Crohn's disease, they get a lot better. You know, this is a family show. <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand, Fecal transplants happen to be the center of this whole discussion. <laughs> so get used to it, girls. <laughs> no, I, I mean, it's, it's true that uh, when you get, if you take a lot of antibiotics, right, and, and knocks out a lot of your bacteria and you have digestive problems typically after that, again, that, that can be set right by sort of recolonizing you with, with a proper balance, you know. And it turns out that, 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 that microbiome balance is very uh, predictive of things. Infants who are malnourished in third world countries have a very different uh, biome than infants who are well nourished in those same countries and their neighbors, basically. Can you explain that? Well, probably, I mean, their whole diet has been different, and that's given a different uh, environment within their whole system, and, the, and there are different things will colonize that. You know, if it's not been in, in as rich in some substances, or it's been overloaded with other substances, different kinds of bacteria are going to go for that. What I'm getting here is that, okay, you come out of your mother's womb, 
you are immediately uh, covered and in, in, infused with uh, a certain biome, mm -hmm. uh, maybe from her, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. the non-sterile part of her, right. um, and uh, maybe from the air, who knows what, right. and, and there you are. You're outfitted with your, well, your, your biome. Your starter set. Okay, but then you go out and you start eating. Right. And you may eat this kind of food or that. Right. You may live in a place where the food is different than the other place. Right. Um, you may have contact with different people and touch them and right. breathe air that's different. So the result is your biome is going to be different. Be you are one. gathering new bacteria right. all the time, and they some of them will colonize, some of them won't. Right. But your mix, I mean, talk about fingerprints right. and the signature of an individual right. human being. Your biome is going to be so complex, they, we don't even know how they, complex. They can actually do that. Now, they can, they can take a fingerprint and sample the DNA, not from you, but from the microbes there, and link it to individuals now, actually. Yeah. And, and it is unique. But getting to the infants again, it's intriguing. And, and Ed Young uh, mentioned this in his book, that mother's milk, it turns out, has all these a bunch of it is actually these very complex sugars that we cannot digest. And these sugars are there apparently for one reason and one reason only. It's to feed the infant's microbiome. <sighs> and so, of course, again, if, if you're, you turn on and giving an infant cow's milk, you know, that doesn't, doesn't have that same mix of things in it. You know. So mother's milk would be better. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Because it's dedicated. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's fine-tuned to, to just that right, that right mix. But well, we get a benefit out of it. It's not I'd just be, for the bacteria. Well, but, but the bacteria then make us thrive, basically, as infants. So yes, I mean, it, it's, it is a symbiosis, as you say, a mutualism, as it were, you know. Okay, but we've been raised, you know, you and me and everybody around has been raised to think that bacteria are germs. Right, right. Bacteria are not good. You don't want to have bacteria. You have, yeah. uh, you know, penicillin sure. and many other drugs that dedicated yeah, to but, killing bacteria. Right, but that's, that's not so. Very few bacteria are sort of all in all bad. Now, as, again, as, as Ed points out in his book, it's, it's all a matter of time and place. And even nice, good, healthy bacteria in one place can be very harmful if it gets into another place or a, another time, basically. So a, a good gut bacteria for you probably isn't going to be so good if it's sitting in your brain, you know. Yeah. Uh, this is getting scary, so much so that I need to take a short break <laughs> just to sort of integrate and digest, if you will, exactly. everything that Ethan has been saying. As Ethan Allen, our chief scientist, the host of Likeable Science, we're talking about the zoo and you and why not. For a very healthy summer, watch Viva Hawaii. We're giving you the best tips and with our best health coach here. So, Viva Health Coach. Viva la comida saludable. Aloha, my name is Josh Green. I serve as senator from the Big Island on the Kona side, and I'm also an emergency room physician. My program here on ThinkTech is called Healthcare in Hawaii. I'll have guests that should be interesting to you twice a month. We'll talk about issues that range from mental health care to drug addiction, to our healthcare system, and any challenges that we face here in Hawaii. We hope you'll join us. Again, thanks for supporting ThinkTech. Hello, I'm Marianne Sasaki. Welcome to ThinkTech Hawaii, where some of the most interesting conversations in Honolulu go on. I have a show on Wednesdays from 1 to 2 called Life in the Law, where we discuss legal issues, politics, governmental topics, and a whole host of issues. I hope you'll join me. Oh my God, that's just fabulous to have this <laughs> conversation with you, Ethan. I really enjoy it. So let, let's talk about uh, the, you know, the deeper level, the deeper meaning, uh, the, the cells uh, of your body um, and uh, the, the relationship of bacteria and, and virus, whether virus works in the same way, because if bacteria is complex, virus would be much more complex. Well, viruses are actually a lot simpler in some sense. Oh, good. <laughs> Right. I mean, bacteria are, are cells, somewhat like our own cells, so that they, are, they have a membrane around them, they've got nuclear material, they, they have a whole cytoplasm of stuff that's within the cell. A virus is just some reproductive material in a shell, and that's all it really is. And it's, they're very tricky. They're not even really alive for much of their existence. Uh, but you'd rather have a bacteria than a virus, well, right? It, it, it you can kill a bacteria. You, virus viruses tend to be a little tougher, harder. Yeah, little, okay. The viruses need the bacteria or our cells to live. So, there you go. but our our cells themselves are actually it turns out fusions of bacteria and other cells. Probably, actually, our very cells themselves are probably originally a fusion of a bacteria and, and, and a so-called archaea, an archaeon, which is another whole group of organisms that look like bacteria but are 
at least as old, if not older, but, and run differently. You're trying to tell me that we are the evolution of the bacteria yes. that we are actually made of. Yes. I mean, in our not not our hosts. I mean, our our, our uh, synergistic yeah. bacteria. But we are really bacteria. So yeah. when somebody for, calls you, you know, a bacteria, <laughs> there's some truth to that. Well, I mean, if you, really for something like you know, 99 percent of the time that life has existed on Earth, the only things that existed were essentially, you know, bacteria type creatures. <sighs> you know, and, and multi multicellular creatures are sort of a quick flash in the pan in, in, the, in the history of life on Earth. And, yeah. You know, haven't haven't proven their staying power at all. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's exciting, yeah. but also disturbing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the world was really built by and, and run by th those things for a long, long time. But so, yeah, you're, the 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 energy sources for all our cells are these little so-called organelles called mitochondria, and all of our cells have these mitochondria, and then they crank out the energy molecules for us and all. They have their own genes. They reproduce independently of the cells. They divide by themselves within your cells. They they were probably at some point another organism that got incorporated at some point. Same with the chloroplasts in plant cells. Those were probably separate. So the, miracle, the, is, the miracle is that the, the bacteria type cells got together and became us. Yeah, at, at some point there were, there were some pretty amazing fusions that went on, you know. Yeah. Wow, wow, what a, what a... Okay, so uh, how can I tell the difference between a bacteria that I like and a bacteria that I don't like. I mean, can I look at the microscope and identify the goodies and the baddies? Not necessarily. Uh, again, there, there are bacteria that are fine in modest doses for you. You can, you can have them, they, they live quietly, and then for various reasons, they go berserk at times. It, it, we, we don't, and we don't always know why, why their population suddenly explodes. And you know, having a few staph bacteria on your skin does nothing particularly harmful, but a bad staph infection can be lethal. Uh, yes. So, uh, uh, Ed Young puts it, you know, it's all, it's all about the right time and the right place for bacteria. Uh, you you want to keep them happy where they belong, basically. He talked about in the program, he talked about C. diff. Right. What is C. diff? So that's a, that's a bacterium that is very good at uh, colonizing us, uh, particularly our intestinal systems, if we've had them sort of flushed out with multiple doses of antibiotics a few times. And C. diff then gets established, keeps everyone else, keeps a lot of other bacterial populations at bay, doesn't let them establish themselves, and keeps you with very nasty diarrhea and can kill you eventually. So um, C. diff is not a good one. No, in general, C. diff is one of that tiny minority who you basically, I don't think you'd really want them at all, at all, at all. You yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, and, and he and Terry Gross talked about how you take a, uh, what do you call it, a fecal uh, uh, transplant. Plant. Uh, yep. and, and that would correct the problem with C. diff 97% of the time. Right, if you, if, you, if you do that, yeah, you'll get a much, you can, you can hopefully then, you know, re-establish re your, your environment in there for a healthy community and that will then, your healthy bacteria will keep the C. diff away. They'll basically won't let the C. diff in. We'll kill them off as soon as they show up. But, but the comparison was that if you went to a, 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 a vitamin store, and you bought a, what do you call it, bi bi biotic drugs, biota drugs? The, the, the prebiotics? The pro Pre probiotics, you mean? Probiotic right. drugs. Um, that would not be as effective. Uh, that, that does not achieve 97%, more like 25%, uh, which means that you do better with a fecal transplant. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the probiotics are apparently pretty limited classes. They're small numbers of bacteria. You, you, you're sort of, they're a little drop in the bucket kind and of thing. they're ephemeral. Yeah, right. They, they, they don't stick with they you. They typically don't don't get well established. Uh, yeah. So yeah, uh, the fecal transplants, as weird as they sound, turn out to be an increasingly popular and increasingly widely recognized treatment for that's pretty effective against a lot of things, actually. So why don't they just make a little pill, a capsule, okay, of the necessary um, biota? Is that the right <laughs> word? Uh, that you take and keep everything in balance and get healthy when you're not so healthy and. You know, just hit the ideal that way with a little it's, pill about that big. Well, it, it's it's real tough. Uh, there's a fair amount of sort of numbers and mass that you've got to deal with there. What's healthy still isn't really well understood. Uh, the things besides the bacteria and the fungi and the uh, protists oh, I and, about and, the fungi. and the viruses. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's, it's going to be a very complex pill to make up you know, and to pack that enough, enough of the right things in together tight enough to keep them all viable in a, in a dry pill form. You know. But uh, what he is saying, though, is that one day we will have a pill like this. Probably. probably. We'll, we'll know more. Oh, yeah.
Because, I mean, you know, it's like uh, my, my sense of it is that we, science, did not really uh, deal with this issue. Only a few years ago we, we started really dealing with it. And, and now that we're dealing with it, we realize that we're at the very beginning of the science. We have a long way to go, but we know what we have to do. Yeah, we, we've just sort of you know, cracked a window on it and can now look out and say, ah, here's this you know, huge frontier that we have to deal with. Yeah. Uh, the, the, and it's happening sort of everywhere. If you look, the oceanographers have discovered the ocean is just filled with viruses. Viruses by the gazillions. Viruses no one had any idea about just a few years ago. And, and strains of virus that we have we, never seen yeah, before. Yeah, and most of them apparently don't do anything bad to us. They may perform vital functions for all we know in, 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 in for the, the sea life. Came but came from but, the oceans. Yeah, so, yeah. It's, so there, the, this stuff... And, and as you say, the technology now, we've gotten gene sequencing up and running to sort of a, you know, a Model T stage where we're suddenly cranking, we're able to crank these things out pretty good. And uh, so we can, we can actually look at this now in, in some sensible fashion. But there's, there's sort of a huge universe still out there to explore, basically. Well, as in so many other things, it seems to me there's a solution here. Because what we have, it's a universe, and it's millions and billions of things and and uh, different kinds of strains and different kinds of, you know, material um, that we have to not only identify, but we have to, you know, distinguish and we have to sort it out and find out how it relates to each I mean, it's really hard and complicated. Um, but also, I believe that in the laboratory, when you start isolating all this stuff and really sorting it out, the one thing that's critical is computer programming. It's keeping a database, a big database. Oh, a, big, a huge database. Yeah, this, what, this, what do you think? This is the this solution or this mm, this advance, if you will, medically, is is going to be dependent on the marriage of the of the biome and computer science. Yeah, yeah. Certainly, it's going to require big data. I mean, all we know now is pretty crude correlations. We know certain, yeah, certain immune d diseases and immune failures are associated with certain kinds of characteristics of microbiomes, but whether those are whether one's causing the other, we don't know. Whether they both have some other causative thing, they're both just effects. That's not at all well understood. And, and it's going to be a very data-intensive, laborious process to start tweaking factors one by one by one by one and, and seeing what's, what, what is the causative agent or agents there. You know? Yeah, um, and, and sometimes you wouldn't know unless you had... It's like you look at the cocktail, uh, all the factors working, and then you find out if you have a certain combination of factors to get this result right but except that, that, that there are the number of possibilities are just enormous it's huge. huge and we have yeah. to know this right yeah and now of course the, the the new thing is you know this whole idea of synthetic biology right you know the, what the, is that so scientists are now able to start building new genomes themselves they can they can create genomes that never existed before and they, they have taken shells of uh, individual cells and, and stuck whole new genomes into them and had had these created these new organisms that are completely artificial and these organisms never existed the boys from Brazil uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, uh, I don't it's, mean the Olympics either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so if we find out if we if I use our science you know we don't get distracted because it's really important to the future of humanity I think if we use our science and we figure out the relationship of uh, what did you call it, uh, tailor-made uh, DNA. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, we, and then we bring in the whole study of tailor-made biomes too. Then we can make people really healthy. And not only determine their characteristics, but determine their health characteristics, the way their bodies work uh, in terms of immunity, in terms of strength, uh, in terms of um, you know, what weight they have, how well they process food. Mm -hmm. Uh, how well they live in general, how long they live, right. and it sounds to me like a lot of the a lot of the answers here are not necessarily in modifying DNA. It's modifying the genome, which is less, you know, disruptive somehow to the, the species. It's, a, it's not. It's not necessarily in modifying our own DNA. It's in learning more about our microbiomes and modifying their, their DNA. DNA. Yes. Yeah. There you have it. Yeah. Uh, and it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a surprise to me that the science instead of focusing on human DNA, starts focusing on biome DNA instead. Right, right. Yeah, it's, and, and as you say, it has, it's known that it can have, this can have profound effects. I mean, they can take mice that tend towards obesity and essentially clean them all out and, and infuse them with uh, the microbiome of mice that tend towards being lean. 
and these mice will then lose weight and, and become lean mice. And become healthier yeah, in right. the process. Yeah, you know. uh, as long as they've got a decent diet to work with. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, these it, are exciting times, you know, and you say to yourself, the, there's really no downside to this kind of science. This is all good. No, there well, is. Well, well, tell me, tell me about the well, downside. I mean, come on, like like any technology, you know, <laughs> it's su subject to abuse. You know, uh, and now, you know, somebody can figure out how how to start designing some super bacterium that's going to be very very nasty to people and uh, unleash it. You know, in some sense, that's much easier game than than blowing up a big bomb somewhere. You know, it's true. And if you've figured out well in advance and figured out how to make yourself immune to it and your friends immune to it, then you have the advantage. Yes, you have a huge advantage. You know? So yeah, or, or it's developing some kind of this, this some kind of process where you kill all the bacteria or modify the bacteria in a bad way, uh, even at distance. And now you know I'm, I'm a goner because I, I can't I can't live without my bacteria. Yeah, that's uh, a pretty that's a pretty tall order. Bacteria are so diverse, so they live in so many different places. It's hard hard to envision that. Yeah, but I'll uh, find some new ones. But the, this whole thing of the, the dual use technology now, you know, technology that can be used for good and used for ill, it's a it's a very it's coming to the fore more and more in science now, um, and, and and it's a thing they have scientists have to grapple with. You know, if, if you begin to work in this area. How do you, what do you do and how do you do to ensure that your work gets sort of used for good and not for ill, you know, as you begin to put stuff out and share it with a broader public? Moral questions. Yeah, 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 they're, 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 whole, they're whole issues. A whole new area of science, really, in our lifetimes, yeah. and a whole new issue of moral questions and risks, for that matter. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ethan. It's been wonderful. It always is to talk with you about these things. So stimulating. It's like Mr. Science when I was a kid. <laughs> thank you for being my Mr. Science. <laughs> well, thank you, Jay. Always a pleasure to be here. I really enjoy it. <laughs>